In general, the layout for today is going to be kind of, you know, I cover the three P's, you know, it's the preparation, uh, and then, of course, the presentation, and then post-closing. And um, I have my little warning on there that most of the stuff on here is free. Anyone who knows my wife, and she can tell you that I'm the most cheap human being she's ever met in her whole life. Uh, so most of the stuff you'll find in here are things that you can incorporate and change, and they, they don't cost any money. I, I'm really, um, when I had my management company, I didn't spend a lot of marketing dollars, but we got a lot of bang uh, for our efforts because uh, most of them were, were free or next to free. So um, two disclaimers. The first one is uh, if, you, if you did uh, get a chance to, to hear this in Las Vegas, I've actually added uh, quite a bit of new material um, just so that you could get some, some additional new things and, of course, some of the old goodies. And, um, you know, there are some topics I specifically took out on, you know, market and social norms and price value strategies, uh, prospecting and qualifying uh, prospects. And, of course, uh, I did a big piece on body language. That's a, a big part of this. And uh, it's really hard to do body language uh, over webinar. So it got yanked. So um, that's kind of first disclaimer. And then, of course, secondly, um, there are tons of uh, academic researchers out there in this field that have made uh, tremendous contributions, including uh, information that I use here today, and, and uh, so I can't uh, claim this as an entirely my own work. And uh, so, if you want to know more, uh, write these folks' names down, and uh, you can go online and they publish uh, many books and, and different academic journals. And so, there's a lot out there. And and uh, I tried to sift through all that stuff and kind of spoon feed you and give you some application for our industry. So, I hope you enjoy. Um, before we get into preparation, I uh, kind of have pre-preparation, and you know, with that, I just kind of give you a few like a uh, few notations here. Um, really, you know, you have to have a vocabulary in behavioral economics. I mean, uh, behavioral economics doesn't seem like it has a whole lot to do with the association management business, uh, but really, behavioral economics is kind of just you know why people buy and why people do the things they do. And I'm sure after this, you'll even think about some of the decisions you make in your own personal life as a consumer. And um, so really, you know, it's important to kind of have a, a, a dialogue because, you know, bias is, is a real force that influences our decision making. And when you use it properly, you can, you can leverage it to persuade people. You, you might even uh, hear me talk about, you know, manipulation. I, I, I don't like that word. I feel like it's kind of got a negative connotation. But uh, we can persuade people to choose us and to choose your service offering. So it's kind of important. And um, I also like having a, a communication uh, language with my staff. When I had a management company, we could talk about why we did certain things, and in the interview, we just fed on each other. And uh, so, having having an actual vocabulary about certain things uh, kind of helped, you know, drive the conversation a little bit. And of course, marketing is, you know, by far the, the most fun part of your job. I know because I've done it. I've been told my mom's a trucker many a times from folks on the phone. They didn't like the violation letters and etc. Uh, so by far, marketing is the most fun. So uh, with that. Um, you know, obviously, there's a, you know two hemispheres of the brain. You have your left side that's logical and analytical, and then of course your right side is more you know intuitive, subjective. And the thing is, you know, we're not robots. You know, we don't we don't take every decision in a vacuum and say, you know, what's more important, my kids or watching the baseball game tonight on TV? You know, you don't always uh, you know have that cost benefit. What's my return on my investment? What's my return on equity? We don't always think that way. Uh, I'm sure most of you, you know, if you bought a home. You, uh, you've used a realtor for your transaction. Who would you use for your realtor? Probably someone you know. Are they the best realtor in your market? Do they specialize in the neighborhoods where you were looking? Probably not. It was probably just somebody you knew and you called them because you didn't know who else to call, right? Whatever those factors are that make you choose that service provider, you know, they kind of come externally and they're not necessarily um, you know, left-brained. So just uh, you know, kind of keep that in mind as we, as we go through this. Now, let's talk about the establishment of bias. Uh, bias is really kind of a, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any notes for today, but the, uh, this is the one slide where I do have some notes and, and just specifically, um, you know, bias is kind of defined as showing unfair tendency. And so, you know, basically, um, you know, you, you, I'm not saying that's a bad thing for an association who's looking to hire you, that, that you'd be a bad decision, but you just want to make sure that they don't hire someone else for the wrong reasons, right? So. Uh, just you know, having the establishment of bias and knowing that it's it's a real force and what its power to do uh, is going to be important. And then of course, um, you know, I want you to also know what the difference between you know behavioral economics and kind of conventional economic theory is. And so I'll take a second and talk about that. Um, behavioral economics, you know, is you know essentially 
Well, in conventional economic theory, we'll start with that one first. You know, you would you would sit in a, in a bubble and say, you know, what is going to make the most sense for me? How is this, you know, best going to benefit my life? And you don't you don't always make decisions that way. So behavioral economics is kind of the the things that happen in your brain, those bias and other factors that make you make decisions um, based on things that would be left brain. So um, it's the most powerful form of marketing. And um, we're going to talk about the buyer's environment a little bit. But um, you'll find out that, you know, I, I heard a funny phrase uh, just a few days ago talking about a Jedi mind trick. And, uh, you know, and, that, and that's kind of what some of this stuff can you know, almost classify as. And so we'll, we'll kind of cover that. But um, before we do, I just want to you know, kind of show you a quick experiment of, uh, of just, you know, how this works and, and um, you know, even kind of show you that, that it's real. Um, I could I could say two words to you. I could talk about uh, dwarves, and I could talk about uh, the deadly sense, right? And then if I said, "Quick, think of a number one through ten, most of you have probably thought of the number seven, okay? And the reason for that is because I primed your brain to make a connection between the number seven, right? Seven dwarfs, seven deadly sense. So that's called priming and spreading activation. And uh, you can even do this uh, over the course of time. So I could even say words like the Easter Bunny, the color orange, and eyesight. Okay, then I could talk about something else for a couple of minutes, and then I could say, quick, think of a vegetable. And you guys can't help but think about carrots, right? And, and your brain naturally makes connections between the Easter bunny, the color orange, and eyesight, you know, and carrots, right? So that, that's kind of how it works. So you can actually use some of this stuff to, um, you know, kind of help, you know, your, your service offering as you are marketing that and how you, you package that up. Um, so your, your, your brain plays tricks on you. Um, one of the things that I like to, you know, also do is just kind of an experiment is, you know, think of a place that you, you like to go to. And uh, one of the places that, that I really like is, uh, is Starbucks. Um, I, love, I love sitting in Starbucks, and um, I don't know what it is about it. I, I, I like, I feel sophisticated when I'm there. I, I, you know, a barista makes my drink. And uh, I, I don't even know what a barista is, but I like that it's not a sales associate. And... I love the smells and the atmosphere and the music, and there's just something about this place that I like. So uh, if you guys all thought about a place that you are a consumer and you like to go to, and I had you make a list of the reasons why you like to go to that place, um, I would say either the word price either wouldn't make it on your list or it would be really far down your list. And so that just kind of goes to show you that we don't always make decisions with our wallet you know, in, in the first position. And so that's kind of what, you know, today's about. Um, you know, one of the alarming trends in our, in our industry right now is that, you know, we seem to be eating each other's fees in, in terms of market. You know, what, what you can get on a per-door basis is, seems to be going down from, you know, previous years, and it's just getting more competitive. And so it's getting harder and harder to get clients to pay a premium for good service. And so, uh, you know, the way to do that is to, kind of appeal to some of these other you know, buying needs that they have. So let's talk about the buyer's environment for a minute. Um, you know, buyer's environment is very egocentric, right? They want to know, you know, what's in it for me? What, what do I get out of this? Okay? Uh, they're naturally suspicious. You know, what's, what's the string attached? I mean, I'm sure you guys have, you know, heard a, a cell phone commercial. Oh, we'll buy you out of your contract. We'll do this. We'll, and you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, where's the catch? You know, you're waiting for the catch. So buyer's environment, you're naturally suspicious. Um, they're visual, uh, and they very they respond very much to storytelling. Um, I'll tell you, you know, I think there was a couple of bankers that had signed up for this for this webinar, and that's really one of the things that uh, that you know, served me well in my banking career is kind of my storytelling selling. And I would tell them about how I got in the business, and uh, you'd be you'd be really surprised to find out, you know, people have their guard up when you're selling a financial product, and and uh, then when they find out they're one of you and you're, they look at you more of a property manager than a banker, then they start to warm up and, and kind of put down their guard a little bit. So I think people, re, you know, respond to storytelling. And, of course, uh, they're very visual. So anytime you can, you can add visuals to it, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, buyers are ever more seeking value. Uh, I, I love the car business. I'm, I'm just fascinated by it. I think uh, it's kind of funny to think, you know, years ago with, without the Internet and having access to what people pay for cars and, I mean, I can sit in a dealership now, and I can negotiate with two other dealerships uh, while I'm sitting in that dealership. You know, that gives me a lot of leverage. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad, he embarrassed the crap out of me, but he took me into a car dealership, and we went on a test drive, and he test drove the car and went to another dealership, 
and then went in and negotiated with the with this second dealership with the guy from the first car company sitting there. It was it was really you know embarrassing, but in a way, my dad was driving leverages back before you know the internet was really you know what it is today. So uh, buyers are, are constantly seeking value, and and you know they're they're smarter, they're much more informed, and with the internet, they can they research on you all kinds of good stuff. Um, but buyers do love to buy, uh, but they hate to be sold to. You know we're we're not gonna we're not gonna show up at your door and, and be a nuisance and and really uh, you know be a pain to you. But uh, we do know that you like to buy and. And so um, we, uh, we'll keep at it with a follow-up. Um, so with that, um, also buyers, they buy with emotion. And um, there's pretty much six main uh, emotions that, that folks buy with. Uh, greed, uh, fear, uh, altruism, pride, envy, shame. You know, obviously I could give you examples for all of these. And you can build some of these into you know, some of your offerings you know, by offering promotions, right? You know, hey, if you if you guys you know sign this contract by the end of January, we're giving you a ten percent discount for the whole year. You know those kinds of things. Or pride. You know, hey, this uh, I, I I lived in Tampa, right? So there's a nice community we manage in Tampa, and uh, I used to um, I used to say, you know what, we manage this property here. Well, other other communities wanted to have the same management company as Avila, where you know all the the who's who of Tampa lives. You know these are the kind of things that um, you know that that you know, had they helped the buyer environment. So if you find your offering maybe has a one of these areas, um, you can actually, you know, kind of use it to your benefit. Um, I could go on all day talking about a vocabulary for uh, behavioral economics. I just try to give you a couple of them so we can stay on task. We're, we're going to try to keep this to 45 minutes if we can. Um, so in the preparation, you know, this is the preparation for getting a uh, an actual interview. Um, I say planning to get the business at plan, uh, game theory, we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, precipitation, if I were to write a book, um, it would actually be titled, Those Who Can Make It Rain, Get Poured On, um, and of course, uh, we'll talk about procrastination for a minute, too. Uh, so uh, planning, uh, basically to get the business, I, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the uh, Adam Sandler movie, Big Daddy, but there's a funny scene in there where, the, you know, Adam Sandler, the main character, is, is, his girlfriend leaves him for some older man, and and uh, the boy, you know, yeah, there was something about, you know, what's that guy's five-year plan? It's not to die, right? So, you know, obviously you want to have your, your business plan be more than just we want to be in business five years from now. But you also don't want a business plan that goes plop, right? I, I've got a picture of John Boehner here who's, you know, sitting behind the, the health care bill. And uh, your business plan should be simple. It should be concise, you know, one to two pages. You want to update it regularly. Uh, there's a great book called um, Chip and Dan Heath are Brothers and, uh, in this space, and they've written a book called um, uh, Made to Stick, and they can talk about how uh, you know a really good idea is sticky and things that you can do. And, and the, one of the things that they kind of promote is like the concreteness of a, of a concept. And uh, I think business plans should kind of be written, you know, with with objective and concreteness, so that um, you, you know your average. Um, employee can can pick it up and know what the direction of the company is and kind of buy into it. So, and um, you know the other thing I want to talk about is word of mouth. I sit with a lot of management companies and you know it kind of catches them off guard. But I say you know tell me how you do your marketing. What kind of advertising do you do? And I ask them and they say oh you know I, I do uh, word of mouth you know. And uh, you know I I'm always been you know a big proponent that word of mouth advertising doesn't work. Um, a couple different reasons. One is it's not very consistent. There's too many peaks and valleys. Um, the second reason is you can't control it. Uh, you don't know what people are saying. You don't know what message they're communicating. So uh, with word of mouth, you can't control the narrative. And that, we'll talk about narrative later on. But um, you know, word of mouth prospects, you know, typically they want a deal, too. You know, they're like, hey, I know a guy. And you know, or, you know, hey, we, they already manage us. If I give you reckon, they'll probably give you a good deal. You know, that kind of thing. So, and of course, it's a double-edged sword too. If you if you mess up, uh, you know, on a community, and that community had you know given your name out to two or three other communities, uh, chances are when they find a new manager, uh, they're going to word of mouth those other properties that you got from them, and and or they'll share with the negative things. And, and unfortunately, sometimes you know things just don't go um, as hoped in the contract. So you know, it's just one of those things where it can be a double-edged sword. And uh, really, the number one reason why I don't like word of mouth advertising is, is uh, most people use it as an excuse to not do any real marketing. And uh, so that's really my, my biggest thing. Um, 
talk about game theory. Uh, game theory is basically just kind of a, a detailed, uh, you know, reconnaissance. I like that word, but kind of a detailed listing and, and research of, of what your competitors do and offer and how they do it. Um, I used to keep very detailed notes on my management companies. Uh, I could tell you some crazy stories, but basically I would sit with an association and I would say, look, who else are you, you interviewing? Who else are you talking to? And uh, they would mention the other firms and I'd say, okay, well, I know that firm. And I would, I would give them kind of the, you know, the, the dirty laundry on those other firms. And the reason why I knew that is because I had all those detailed notes on them. I would say, hey, listen, this person, they're going to represent you and, you know, they've got 15 communities in their portfolio. They don't even, you know, they don't even like their job. I heard they were looking around or they've done this, they've done that. You know, so, you know, one of the ways that, you know, I'll just you know, share with you how you can get some of this reconnaissance uh, on this, on their information is, um, you know, obviously websites, you can do some of that, you know, borderline stalking. But one of the things that I used to do is um, I would keep an open requisition at my company at all times. And the thought process behind that is that, um, you know, we would get we would get applications from time to time with a resume, and I call the people up immediately and say, hey, you want to grab lunch or coffee? And I'd say, I'm not looking to hire right now, but I've got, you know, 8, 10, 12 proposals out at any given time, which was true. And I said, if uh, if all these hit, I'm going to need somebody quick, and I kind of want to know who I want to have. So they're looking for a job, so they agree to meet you, and you go get coffee, and next thing you know, you're talking about, you know, the firm that they work for, and they're giving you, you know, all of the, the dirty laundry. So you, you start gathering this information, and so game theory is kind of a you know, very strategic approach to you know giving you know the who, the what, what software, where they're located, you know what things they're good at and bad at, and you know this is important because if you get a property from you know ABC Property Management Company and the the association that you got from them had you know very specific uh, service deficiencies, well guess what? Some of the other you know opportunities that you have that are managed by those folks, they're going to have the same service deficiencies. And so if you keep track of that stuff, you'll know how to market. You'll know what those hot buttons are when you get a chance to speak with those firms. So it's kind of important to, to keep that updated and, and work hard to uh, keep that you know, in your arsenal. Um, precipitation, uh, rainmakers, you know, it's, uh, I told you this is the thing I, I do about my book. Um, you know, really, you know, there's a lot of different ways management companies can make money, and I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong. Uh, but we definitely had a, uh, you know, kind of a, a low-cost leader, if you will, so that we could promote a, a different avenue of our business. But um, that's really kind of what precipitation is. And, you know, I'll give a couple examples. One's like an oil change place. You know, off, you know, you know, I put a little ad on here, right? $10 oil change. I mean, if anybody's bought a, a you know, quart of oil at the local, you know, auto parts store, there's no way they can put oil in the car for 10 bucks. I mean, they lose money on that even. So... But they're doing it because they want to swap out your, you know, your air conditioner filter and your wiper blades at exorbitant margins, right? So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of how they do it. They want you to come in there for minor repairs, and, and so that's kind of, that's kind of it. They just want to get you in the door. It's a small yes to get you put in the door to, to get you to do other things and establish a relationship and kind of be their, their, you know, advisor, right? And so that's kind of the idea behind precipitation. Um, you know, one of the things that my firm used to do is. Uh, you know, we would actually send our, our folks out to very specific properties that we were trying to court for our, our portfolio, and I would have them do violation sweeps and stuff and try to see if they could find, you know, really egregious problems or maybe even a deficiency with the, uh, the community. And then we'd reach out to those community boards and say, you know, look, we, we drove by and we noticed that, uh, you know, your guardhouse has got problems, ABC, you know, can I meet you on site? I want to introduce you to you know, somebody that can help you with that, et cetera. And uh, I could tell you numerous stories of properties that I got that way. Uh, one of them was a sign company. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a sign company that, that I worked with quite a bit, and I drove by this community, and somebody had crashed into their, their front entry sign, and it had been that way for like three weeks. And, and uh, so I finally reached out to the board member, and I said, listen, this is who I am. This is what I do. I, want to, you know, I don't need anything from you. I just want to meet you on site. I want to introduce you to my sign company. They do fantastic work. Can you meet me on site today? The guy was blown away. I meet with him on site. My sign company gave him a proposal. It was, you know, a fabulous price. I mean, he took good care of him. And uh, so he calls his manager and says, hey, I need you to cut a check to the sign company. And it was done. Well, then from that point forward, I had an advocate on the board. And so these are kind of some of the things that you can do to kind of precipitate, you know, future opportunities and, and kind of have people out there, you know, with, with your name on the tip of their tongue in a positive light to, you know, push their... Uh, push your agendas. So, 
Uh, procrastination, I have a little uh, little pipeline here. I, I tried to modify it so hopefully uh, it reads clearly enough. But uh, basically, you know, if you have a choice between doing marketing or preparing for a community meeting tonight, uh, chances are you're probably going to prepare for that community meeting. I mean, that, that's just the way it is. It has to, has to do that. So uh, procrastination is probably the, you know, in my opinion, probably the number one reason why businesses fail. I know a lot of the experts say, oh, they're undercapitalized, and you know that's a fancy accounting way of saying, yeah, well, they didn't have cash flow, and they didn't have cash flow because they didn't have revenue and sales, and they didn't have sales because they didn't do marketing. And I think most people just procrastinate, and for various reasons, and you know, you can't wait to the last minute to do marketing because what ends up happening is you have these feast and famine cycles. So you you, you bust you know tail, and there was one January in particular we had added like four or five associations at one time. And it was like, you know, we just kind of crushed our office staff and some of the managers. There was a lot to take on all at one time. And so they said, hey, no more properties until we can kind of get, you know, get our head above water on these. So we stopped marketing for, for about a month or two. And then our pipeline dried up. And so then I had to get back out there and rebuild the pipeline. And then it wasn't until April or May before we started to close new business. And so I had this gap in between. And so, you know, it's important that you kind of understand that you continuously have to put stuff in the pipeline and, and, uh, and really just don't procrastinate about it. A um, couple ways that you know beat procrastination is you know plan a designated time to market. A lot of folks hire you know marketing people and then they have them do other things. Uh, that's disastrous. Don't do that. Uh, if you hire a marketing person, make them do marketing. Um, you know plan design des designated times. You know stick to your designated time and punish yourself or your staff if you don't. If you if something else comes up and you have to do it, then you know you have to give up a Saturday with your your family or you know find ways that you can keep yourself accountable. Uh, so that you can beat procrastination. All right, so um, we'll talk about the presentation a little bit, and uh, apologize if I'm flying through these. I want to, you know, offer as much time on the backside for questions. But um, in the presentation, uh, a couple things. You know, I, I've sat on many presentations as a guest of some of my management companies. So I always offer this as a service so that um, I can kind of give them some coaching and kind of a post mortem and. Uh, every every once in a while, I'm even in there, and, and uh, I even have to step in in the interview just because they're missing the killer instinct to close the deal. But uh, in general, uh, you know, the way that I like to do my presentations was about a quarter percent of my presentation on my qualifications. And if you're a newer firm, you want to spend less than that. They uh, they only they only think you don't know what you're talking about if you you know confirm that with them. So the less you talk, the more they think you know, which is kind of weird. But uh, so spend a, you know, a quarter or less of the time on your qualifications. Uh, you want to spend about a quarter of the time on your actual fit. You know, fit is a word I like to use a lot on the banking side of things, but it's also appropriate for you know, managers as well. And then I spend about half the time talking about the transition, how easy it is, and you know, I have very clear next steps, and I make sure that, that they know how easy it is. And we'll, we'll talk about why transition in a minute, but we'll get to that. Um, anchoring. Uh, if anybody, you know, I talked about the car business before. If anybody's ever bought a car, you know, you go there and they have some crazy sticker price. You know, it's you know, a pickup truck is thirty-eight thousand dollars, but we'll sell to you for twenty-two, right? Well, that thirty-eight thousand dollars is an anchor, right? And they're trying to anchor you on a higher value amount and show you, hey, I'm getting you five thousand dollars in discount and forty-five hundred dollars in rebates, and we've got cash for this and cash for that, and, that, and so they're anchoring you. Uh, on a higher price, and you know, anchoring is something that you can use, uh, you know, to your advantage, based on you know what contract they have now. Uh, you know, I used to sit with a firm all the time or a community all the time, and they'd say, you know, hey, we got your proposal, we think you're great, your qualifications are amazing, you know, you can sounds like you can walk on water, but your price is kind of expensive. You know, what what's the deal with that? And I'm like, look, you know, you're paying X dollars now, but they're not doing the job. They're not doing the work. They're cutting corners. And part of the reason why is because you know their fees are not high enough. And so I would use their existing uh, price, you know, as an anchor, even though it was lower. Uh, you know, why I was going to add value to their service offer. So anyway, you get you get a sense of, of how anchoring can be used. Um, it's most easily done with pricing uh, strategies, and you know, again, I, I apologize for not being able to get into the price value strategies more. But um, you know, if you if you do anchoring well, you know, you can anchor them. Uh, do I buy to which one I buy? And uh, I'll tell you, Dan Ariely is a great resource on this. He's a professor at Duke University, was previously at MIT, and uh, he got brought in from William and Sonoma to be a, um, an advisor. And they had this bread machine, and they couldn't sell it. 
and then you know they said, hey Dan, we got this bread machine, we can't sell it. We want you to come in here and help us, you know, get moving, you get this thing off the off the shelf. And so he comes in and uh, so he says, the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to create another bread machine model, and you're going to make it more higher end and more expensive with a few more bells and whistles, and you're going to mark it up for a little bit more. And there, you know, all the market, all the you know, the executives in the room are like, this guy's absolutely nuts. We can't sell a bread machine. Why would he have us go create another one that's more expensive? Well, what ended up happening is they they put it out in the marketplace and they did exactly as he as he recommended. And what happened? They can't keep either one of them on the shelf. Both of them are selling because he had shifted through an anchoring of you know, do I buy this bread machine or not? The decision became which one do I buy? Do I want the one that's fancier for a few extra bucks or do I want the more of the value model? And it gave them some some you know relative value of what a bread machine's worth, and so that's why anchoring you know can be a, a valuable tool. All right, um, decoy effect. Um, this is uh, this is something I, I use uh, on my daughter all the time. Uh, you know, one of the things that she likes to do is she likes to dress herself. She's uh, eight years old, and and so not all of the outfits that she picks out uh, are acceptable to mom and dad. So. Uh, what we what we'll do is we'll give her an option of three outfits, and we will purposely put one in there that we know she will not pick. And uh, you know, part of that is that one is the decoy, but uh, what it also does is it combines the anchoring and decoying kind of together. So then we have the other two of the outfits that are acceptable to us. Uh, there's one in particular that we like, and we try to find one that's similar to that one, but maybe a little slightly less desirable, or maybe we know that she likes a little bit less than the other one. And so we're able to make her pick the one outfit of the three that we want, and we make it completely her decision. And she doesn't even know, but she's picking the one that mom and dad want her to wear. Now, if I came to her and I said, Hannah, I want you to wear this outfit, she'd probably say that she didn't want to wear it just because I asked her to do it, because that's what little kids do. And uh, you can do this with your, with your service offerings in this business, too. Uh, one of the things I, I used to do is I would sit with folks, and we'll talk about a man hour estimate in a minute, but I'd find out what their needs are, and uh, I would, I would, you know, create a proposal of of what they asked for, and then I would create a proposal of what I thought they needed based on, you know, different recommendations and stuff that I had, or maybe they're needing too much or not enough or et cetera. And so I would have a second proposal in there, and then I would give them a third proposal that was for an on-site manager. Okay, and this served two functions. One, um, they didn't ask for it, but I, I put it in there because I wanted them to know that I'm not a full-time manager. I do not manage your property for 40 hours a week. I have other properties, you know, and in some crazy, you know, enterprising scheme to make money, I have more than one property, okay? And so I wanted them to know that, and it kind of sets like a tone mentally that, hey, this is portfolio management, not on-site management. And then third of all, I used it as an anchor to a, to a higher price point of, if you want on-site management, this is what it costs, and kind of gives them a sense of the value of the package they were getting. And so that's, those are different ways that you can use decoy effect. I, I mean, we could literally sit here. I, I, can, I could advise people for weeks on designing decoys and, and their offerings. So uh, you may have questions around here. We'll see. Um, the IKEA effect. Um, the IKEA effect is really simple. Basically, people who help build something have a higher level of ownership of it. And uh, you know, it's called IKEA effect because you go to IKEA, you buy the furniture, and some assembly is required. And uh, you know, basically, that's, that you can have that with your management company. I, I call them cafeteria style proposals, and uh, I'll show you an example of one here upcoming in a couple slides. But basically, I would design you know a, a set of services around what they need, and I I would present this to them, and you know they they helped drive my proposal. So instead of coming some pie in the sky number of hey it's seventeen hundred dollars a month for services, I would show them a detailed breakdown, and and we would kind of work on it together. It was kind of a back and forth process, if you will. And uh, so we'll talk about the IKEA effect in a little bit, but you know, at the end of the day, people like to participate. Uh, one of the stories that, that I love, um, again, I'm going to mention Dan Ariely specifically. He did an experiment, and um, he worked with some folks at, uh, I think it was Betty Crocker, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, they, their sales were down on their cake mix. And um, you know, they, they came to him and said, hey, our sales are down on cake mix. You know, what can we do? Well, those of you who like to bake cakes, you'll remember a few years ago, all you had to do was add water, mix it up, and throw it in the oven, and it was done. And so what they found out is the people who bake cakes, they like to feel like they're baking. Well, just adding water to a cake mix isn't baking. So they reformulated the powder so that you now have to add 
you know, a little bit of water or oil, and you got to add two eggs, and you got to add a, add a stick of butter, and, and so now they, they added a couple more ingredients to it, and now people feel like they're building it, they're a part of it, so they have a higher level of ownership of it, and sure enough, uptick in sales, and uh, you know, looking like the hero again. And you know, really, it doesn't cost a lot of money to, to invest in you know some of these behavioral ideas. Just want to reiterate the the fact that most of this stuff, you know, I don't think I've spent anyone's money just yet. So I'll keep that in mind. All right, so let's talk about the IKEA effect in terms of a, a man hour estimate. Um, one of the things that I absolutely despise in this industry is the, the notion of a per door or per unit cost. You know, what's your per door rate? Some people will call me and ask me that. I'm just like, you know, that's just crazy. That's just, you're just assuming that, you know, all service packages are exactly the same. They're the same number of meetings, the same number of violations, the same number of units, the same number of, you know, emails and craziness and, you know, board shenanigans that you're going to have to deal with. And so I always, you know, absolutely just dislike that philosophy in general. And so what I would do is, and I can't show you the actual one that I used in my business because I'm still bound by some, uh, some do not compete type things, but I have, uh, I have provided kind of something that we use. It's just kind of a representation of kind of how it works. And uh, basically we take the task, we take the number of hours the task you know, requires to do, and then I would give a rate based on what type of staff was going to be, you know, providing that service, and then the number of times, you know, that they needed that service, and then it multiplies out, and of course it adds up at the bottom, and then I put the per door back in there just, you know, because people are crazy and they still ask for it, and uh, they show how it works. And then what I would do is I would actually present this uh, to the board, and I would say, look, this is what it costs for me to do, you know, the services as you, you've requested from me. And, um, you know, what would happen invariably is they would say, okay, great, we, we love you, we want to do this, you know, can we, can you take a haircut, I mean, well, can we, can you work with us a little bit on your, on your feet? And I would say, back in the old days, before I did this, I would say, look, you know, I, I, uh, I just, I just lop off a hundred bucks off of the, the monthly fee, and then we go about our, our contract and do it. Well, the thing is, I could never get that money back. I could never, you know, get them to raise their fees and, and come back and, and allow me to, to charge that money again. So with this, with this uh, kind of cafeteria-style proposal, I would say, look, this is what it costs me to do the work for you. If you want to save money, you guys can do any of these tasks listed on this, uh, you know, on this sheet here, and I'll give you dollar for dollar that item. We'll strike it right off the list, and so they, you know, invariably there's this one guy, Bob, he'd want to strike it off, you know, we'll do our own meeting minutes or whatever. And then what would happen is three months later, I'm, I'm doing the meeting minutes, even though I'm not supposed to, and then I come back to the board and say, hey guys, listen, you know, I've got this, uh, here's my additional service authorization. When we met the first time we did this contract, you guys were supposed to do the meeting minutes. They haven't been getting done. I went ahead and took care of them for the last three months of the courtesy, but now it's time to get paid for those. So if you guys would go ahead and, and sign this, we'll be good to go. And of course the other board members, they'd say, yeah, yeah, Bob's an idiot. And we're we're going to move forward with this. And so that way I got my full asking price on my contracts. And it puts a value for my time. And so you can kind of see how it works uh, in general. But uh, again, you know, they're, they're participating in the, in the process of building this. And so they have a higher level of ownership of what my end of the, you know, my end of the day number is of what it costs for me to provide my offering. All right, so um, one of the things I told you earlier in the presentation was talking about how you spend half the time talking about transition. Uh, your, your number one competitor, you know, in you know, in the management business. Uh, if I were to ask every management company individually, this they might you know list uh, the name of some company across town or something like that. But I'll tell you, the number one competitor that you deal with on a daily basis is the no decision. Okay, and that's just people just staying exactly where they are. You know, they're they're with uh, ABC Management Company, and um, you know, they're maybe their contract's coming up in a few months for renewal. You know, they're going to look around. You know, chances are you're probably not competing with the folks that you know they're getting proposals from. You're probably competing with what they have right now. And you know, we used to have a philosophy that that uh, you know people will essentially make a change when you know you know the, the the pain of same outweighs the pain of change, right? And so you know you have to make it easy to make the transition. If you make it easy to make the transition, then the amount of pain required for them to make that off balance where they'll make the change is lower. And so that's what you want to do. So you, you want to try to make it as easy as possible. And uh, you know, one of the things that we used to do is really kind of market around our white glove concierge transition team. You know, these are fancy ways of saying, yeah, 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 I got a guy that helps you make the move. It's easy, right? So 
uh, we would say, look, this is really simple. All you got to do is, uh, you know, you just need to sign this piece of paper right here. And we actually, uh, we, had, we would joke and say, breaking up is hard to do. And uh, we would even break it with your old management company for you. We'd call them, give them a courtesy, and say, hey, we're, they're going a different direction. And I was like, hey, where were you when I was dating? That would be awesome to break up with girlfriends that way. But uh, anyway, you, you get an idea of, of kind of, you know, how you can brand your transition to uh, help you uh, grow your firm. All right, so um, one of the things that we used to do, and uh, this is something everyone does, is kind of a commonality in the, in the business. So I've talked to folks from the West Coast all the way to the Southeast, where I'm at now. And uh, I, everyone does reference letters of some sort. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I, when I first got started, I even, I even did it the way most people do it now. And, and you call, and they're like, oh, you know, is he doing a good job? You recommend him? You know, it's very, you know, kind of just not real in-depth stuff. And so what we did was we started creating these reference letters. And what I would do is I would, uh, I would give them a list of questions to ask my, my reference. And I would say, listen, I don't care what you ask my reference. You can ask them what color their underwear is. I don't really care. But I just want you to make sure you at least ask them these five or six, seven questions. And I also ask that you ask these same five or six, seven questions to my competitor's references. And then you know, what I would do is I would give them questions of the five or six or seven that highlighted my, my differences, what, what, you know, things that made me better than the other firms that they were looking at. And I would kind of handcraft these uh, questions based on my game theory reconnaissance that I have you know, records of. And you know, instead of saying, you know, what's their overall impression, that kind of thing, I would say, hey, how quickly do they get financial statements out after the end of the month? Well, it, with my company, if you didn't get your financials out by the fifth of the month, that month management fee was free, right? So then they asked my competitor's reference, and they say, hey, you know, yeah, we, we meet on like the third Thursday of the month, and I guess we get the financials like I guess usually the day before that. So what's that like the twentieth, twenty second of the month? So you know, typically you're getting about three weeks late. Now you're starting to separate the men from the boys, you know, in their in the two different you know references, right? And you know, it's all about controlling narrative. I'm not even a part of the process of my prospect calling one of my competitors' existing clients for a reference, but I'm controlling that narrative just by simply offering a reference letter and having them and having them call that. And it makes them look good because you know they're calling those folks with really good, tough, poignant questions. And uh, you know, furthermore, I kind of take it another step farther. I also give my reference letter to my existing client, and I say, "Look, this guy Bob from such and such HOA is going to call you. Here's the questions he's probably going to ask you." And so I would give him the list of questions, and I would even put the answers on there for him just to make sure that he further, you know, gave them my guided narrative. And he might say, "You know, look, if they don't give him by the fifth of the month, that month management fee is free." But I'll be really honest with you, I typically got them on the first or the second day of the month. They, even, they usually come even faster than that. And so sometimes they might even add to it. And, that, and that's fabulous. That even one-ups. But you can kind of get a sense of, of how the questioning goes. And when they call my reference and they're answering questions, you know, snap of a finger quick, it gives a certain pace to the phone conversation. very confident. And then, you know, when they call the, my competitor's reference, it's kind of more like, uh, uh, um, well, you know, so it doesn't quite have the same professionalism. So... Uh, definitely something you can add to your arsenal. And again, how much does it cost? Nothing. It's free. Um, I talk about body language. I, I really don't. Um, I, we, we could spend an hour just talking about body language. Maybe uh, you know, Andrea. I'm just making a recommendation. Maybe we do another one of these webinars on body language. I could spend a whole day talking about it. Uh, but there's, you know, really just one quick thing. I just want to kind of show you there are, you know, certain human natures that people have, and they're kind of almost like animal instincts. But we don't like to have our back to certain things. Um, I show you, uh, and on the left-hand side of the graphic, the vulnerable seats, those two seats that are right in front of the door. If you're in a big, giant conference room or you invite someone to your office to meet with them, uh, don't sit right there in front of the door. You're going to make them feel uncomfortable, and you're not even going to be aware of it. Uh, this is something that you learn in architecture school. They teach you a lot about your physical environment and your surroundings, and people spend a lot of time and their livelihoods depend on designing places that make people comfortable. But... Uh, and again, on the right-hand side, I kind of show you, uh, you know, negotiating seats. You don't want to negotiate across from somebody. Kind of creates a, uh, you know, a space of, you know, me versus you. You kind of want the one on top, on the top right-hand side, where you see, uh, you know, you're kind of on the same side. Hey, we're on the same team. You're psychologically telling them that. Um, this also goes for restaurants. If anybody's dating and you go to a restaurant and you want to make you know, the person that you're eating with, uh, you know, comfortable. You know, let them have their back to the wall. You know, you put yourself in the vulnerable seat. 
you know, this also can work for you. If you're going to ask your boss for a raise, take him to lunch and then put him where he's facing the wall. He's got his back to the entire restaurant, and then you've got your back to the wall facing him, facing the entire restaurant, and he's in that vulnerable seat. He's kind of on an island. You know, the waitresses are passing behind him, carrying heavy trays, and you want to make him vulnerable. Use it to your advantage. This is, this is uh, proven stuff. There's tons and tons of literature and research on this. Uh, you, can, you can get drunk reading this stuff. It's just great stuff, and you'll love it. You can mess around with it and, and wow your friends. Um, I do highly recommend reading a body language book uh, in an airport. You'll uh, have a good time with that, especially if you're a people watcher like me. Okay, um, post-closing, so you've given your presentation, uh, now what? Um, a couple things that I recommend is, you know, start working immediately. Um, there were many times where I interviewed for a, uh, a community, and believe it or not, I wasn't their first choice uh, after the interview. I find that hard to believe because I'm so wonderful. Yeah, right? But, uh, you know, what I would do is I would start working. You know, maybe they, maybe they communicated to me that they had some pond issues or landscape issues or legal issues, and I would, I would get them in touch with my attorneys and my different folks, and I would, you know, start meeting on site like they just gave me the okay to go forward. And um, I would say, hey, look, I know you're still making your decision, but, you know, in the meantime, you guys really need to meet my attorney and et cetera, et cetera. And so I would just start going to work, and, and uh, the clients, man, they would just, they just loved it and ate that up. And there were many times where I picked up a property where they told me, you know, after the interview, you weren't our first choice, but in those three or four days afterward, you really earned our business because we just know that you're going to get the work done. And, and uh, that's our biggest problem is we ask our manager to do all this stuff, and it just never gets done. It always gets pushed to the next month. And, and so anyway, that's kind of um, that, that's kind of something you can incorporate. Um, next thing is uh, on follow-up. I'm not going to read all of these uh, to everybody because that would be pretty boring, but I think the, you know, the staggering one is down at the bottom. You know, 80% of sales are made to the fifth or twelfth contact, right? So uh, most people give up after the first or second contact, and that's exactly why they're not successful. Uh, for those of you uh, bankers on the phone, if there are any, um, you know, this is, this is you know, holy and sacred. It's all about contacts. And uh, one of the things we do at State Bank is we usually will design like a contact plan, which I'll show you in a second. So we might have a warming prospect letter. Uh, you know, might have uh, and a warming prospect letter is uh, is kind of funny. I, I like messing with people uh, every once in a while. I just do social experiments uh, as part of my job, which is great. But I'll send them a letter saying, "Hey, I'm going to come visit you next Tuesday, right?" And they they're not expecting me or anything. I'm just cold called my way into this, right? So I send them a letter and I'm going to visit you next Tuesday. And uh, I send them a letter, and then I show up the following Tuesday, and the receptionist says, I say, yeah, I'm here to see so-and-so. And they say, oh, do you have an appointment? I said, no, but he's expecting me, right? And it's true. I sent him a letter. And so she's like, oh, you know, and of course, you know, he saw my letter, or maybe he didn't even open it, but kind of recognizes the name. And he's like, oh, I probably should have read that. And so he takes my appointment. So there's, there's different ways you can, you know, kind of use warming letters. And, but uh, we like to plan out kind of our, uh, our approach with different folks. And a lot of times I'll ask the client, you know, the client shows initial interest, and I'll say, you know, how do you want to follow up? And I'll let them design the contact plan. But uh, I really try to get to that fifth, twelfth uh, contact, you know, in an actual strategized manner. Um, you know, BB&T, they have this guy, Ron Peck, he's their national sales manager, great guy. Uh, he has this philosophy, and I give him credit for it, uh, so that's why I mentioned him. Uh, basically, he says, you know, if they like you, they trust you, and if they trust you, um, they'll, they'll eventually buy from you. So, and that's that's kind of you know it's, it's a process, right? And I uh, put this you know, homeless guy on here, right? He's just you know instead of being hey, we'll work for food. He's just being hey, look, you know, I just want to buy a beer, right? He's just being honest. So he's, he's likable. So you give him money, and that's kind of how it is. You know, if, if you you know if you're a guy and you, you meet a girl for the first time and you you asked her to, to sleep with you the first time you met her, you come across as a really creepy guy. You know, but if you if you came across and you said something kind of interesting or made her laugh or maybe hey my name's Rick I'm such and such and maybe you have a conversation maybe you go on a couple dates maybe you start dating then you start getting exclusive you know maybe there's a process to it right so it takes time and you kind of need to think about it like that with your communities and your follow up plan or if you're a service provider you know even working on and with those management companies. Um, cost of keeping clients uh, really despised making uh, price adjustments. Once you go to that uh, cafeteria style plan, you have to do it a lot less because you make them take on more of the responsibility. There are times, though, when it actually makes sense to make a price concession. Uh, there's tons of research on this, but 
basically costs about seven times more to get a new client than it does to keep an existing one. So uh, when it makes sense and you know and, and you try to mitigate all the ways that you could do it, don't be afraid to make a price concession when you need to. So I uh, just like to throw that out there for folks. And uh, we're wrapping up here. We've got a last couple slides. So I'll kind of power through them, but. Uh, you can't see my hands here. I've got one here up near the ceiling and one near the floor. But uh, really, you know, Lou Holtz used to say, you know, Notre Dame football was up here, right near the ceiling, and everyone else was down here near the floor. And he said the reason why Notre Dame football is now no longer the best program in the country is because they just maintained. You know, they, they quit getting better. And everyone else kept getting better, and they closed the gap. So you can imagine my hand on the floor is getting closer to the ceiling, closing the gap. And, uh, and so... You know, there's there's uh, books out there on this, but you know, I just encourage you, you know, the slight edge, right? So take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes every day, and do something that gives you a competitive advantage uh, over your, you know, competitors uh, in this space. You know, whether it's you know listening to a, a podcast or you read a, uh, the top blog or you know sitting in on this conference, whatever it is that that um, you can do to make yourself better, more competitive, more sharp, to think about things differently, incorporating you know, things that work in other industries into ours. Anything that you can do like that continues to better your firm, and then you're going to continue to spread the gap of, of why your service offering is better and more valuable. And uh, so I really encourage you doing that. I'm sure most people in here watch a lot of TV. If you just cut out even one show a week or two a week or three a week, You'd be surprised on what you could, you know, enrich your mind with by reading books or getting into body language or you know anything in this in this space. So I want to encourage you to, to do that, and you know those small little blocks of time they'll they'll add up uh, tremendously. A um, couple things, you know, you are the way you are because that's the way you want to be, and if you wanted to be any different, you would already be in the process of changing yourself. Uh, and this probably surprised a lot of people, but I used to play college football, and, and one of my coaches, that was his, his, uh, his motto all the time. I heard it, you know, it got just beat into me. And basically, if you want to make a change, you, you, you need to already do that. And, you know, I'd laugh about, you know, New Year's Eve resolutions. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to start tomorrow. No, just start a couple days before New Year's. Once you know that's your resolution, just get started and go do it, because that's, that's how you're going to make it a habit. And so that's kind of how it is with this, and I want to encourage you that way. And, um, if anyone wants to know who the who's who of behavioral economics are, you know, reach out to me. I can share with you, uh, you know, all the different folks and resources that I, I read and I enjoy, and, and I think you'll get a lot out of them. And maybe you'll pick up on something I missed, and uh, it'll be, you know, a million dollar idea for you. So I really hope um, you do that. You know, really, this 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 seminar might be your first step to changing, and you know, this is kind of the the raw raw part of it. But you know, just just pick up where we are today, and, and what are you going to do tomorrow? Plan out you know, something that, that drives you and makes you better. So I, I want to encourage you in that way. And um, that's pretty much it for now for, for time-wise. And uh, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. I know I ran over a little bit, so I apologize for that, Andrea, but I'll do the best I can to, uh, to be concise in my answers. And if you're if too shy to ask, um, then uh, feel free to reach out to me privately. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to put it into the questions tab in the webinar interface, um, and I'll pick them up and, and ask James them. And, and while I'm waiting to see if we get some questions, James, I just have to say that was a phenomenal uh, webinar. I, I found myself, even after having heard you speak before, I found myself uh, just getting inspired all over again. And um, I partic you know, you really settled into it, you know, toward the middle of the end, and and just really, I I got you. I was right there with the, you know, uh, giving choices to ch to steer somebody toward the decision that you want to make, and a whole new way to price out your your management company uh, with a, a sort of cafeteria style pricing. I mean, I just really, uh, I can't wait to get on the blog, the the Top Scan blog and start writing about these things that you talked about because I'm just incredibly inspired. Um, and I wanted to say, too, you talked at the very end about um, people who inspire you, particularly in the field of, of behavioral economics. And I actually saw at the beginning of your presentation where you had mentioned um, a name that stuck out to me, and that name was Stephen Dubner. And I just wanted to say, like, I am such a big fan of him. He did a movie. You can see it on Netflix. It's called Freakonomics. And um, he basically uses the science of economics to understand why you know, things happen in the world the way they do. 
and it's incredibly entertaining and so fun. Like you can't believe you're learning, the, you know, science. <laughs> and I That's really, um, I really felt like you married that that kind of, you know, what he brings to Freakonomics. I feel like you married that to the community association industry today. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start hitting you. The questions are flying in while we're talking, so I'm going to start hitting you with a couple of them. First, uh, there's one that I can answer, so I'm going to do that really quick. Uh, the question was, are we going to be having a campfire conference in Las Vegas this year? Um, the answer is no. We've decided to go to a one-per-year format for campfire. And the reason for that is we, we did two this past year, and it really just wore us out, and we felt like we couldn't devote all of our attention because we had to split our resources. So we want to do it bigger and better in the coming years. So we're going to focus and just do one at a time. So the next one, again, is going to be in February uh, of 2016 in Orlando. And we'll have more announcements for that on the blog if anybody's interested. And now, James, uh, one for you. Um, did you ever use a lead generator, uh, such as all property management, and do you find those useful? Um, I personally did not use those. Um, I would say that um, I was probably a little atypical. I never even participated in a CAI function until I worked at the bank. Um, you know, I kind of felt like it was more of a, a meat market. You know, it was kind of you're the pretty girl in the room, and you know, a lot of a lot of interested parties, and it's kind of a lot of vendors. So I didn't do CAI, and um, I really didn't do a lot of those lead generators. Um, I do have some clients that use those and had some success with them. I would say the ones that um, were the most successful kind of used them as a new company. And um, the problem that they kind of experienced with them is they seemed to, to generate a little bit lower uh, yielding contracts, you know, the three, five hundred, seven hundred dollars a month, kind of lower, smaller stuff, uh, which is, if that's your market and, and all that, that's fine. In Tampa, that's really hard to make a living off of. And, uh, and so they're, you know, that, that's kind of been kind of the complaint that I've gotten from those, from those folks about that. One of the things that I like to, you know, I never consider myself a good-looking guy. I kind of, you know, just the way I was. And if a girl was interested in me, I was like, what's wrong with her? Right? And it kind of goes that way for associations, too. Like uh, I'd sit with somebody and say, you know, tell me about your property and what, you know, why are you guys interested in coming to us? You, it seems like you're with a good management company from what, I, from what I've heard. You know, what are you doing? And they're like, well, I've been with three or four management companies in three or four years. And, you know, so a lot of those are the kind of leads that you get through some of those programs. So I'm not saying they can't work; they absolutely can. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't know what the returns are on them and all the exact science from my personal use because I didn't use them. But I do know people that use them, and they uh, they say they work. And you know, typically those folks seem to be in the smaller market or newer management company space. If you're established, you're looking to only add quality uh, companies. I'm sorry, quality associations. Um, there's different you know, questions you can ask uh, to, to kind of weed out the ones that are quality or not. Um, some of the things that I like to know is you know, who, who goes to their board meetings. You know, if they have a lot of people attending board meetings, that may not be an association you want to get involved with because usually people show up when there's problems. Um, I also want to know what the board members did for a living. If you have a bunch of retired folks, and unless that's kind of your market is doing you know, 55 plus communities, you know, some of these retired folks can, can absolutely kill you. Um, I had a guy that was a federal government auditor on one of my boards. He was a pain in the rear end from an accounting perspective. So you can kind of see, you know, you're looking for fit. So there's certain questions that you can ask where they won't be obvious that you're you're interviewing them more than they're interviewing you. And it's a little hard to do with lead generator. Thanks, James. That was a really well thought out answer, and, and I'm laughing behind the mute uh, at the federal auditor on the board because I think we've all been there. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've got a lot of questions of people asking, is this presentation going to be available later, or are the slides going to be available? And the answer is yes, we are going to make it available. Um, we'll contact everybody who attended via email with some information about that, and maybe going on the blog. I'm not sure. We have to see how big the video is first. Uh, but we have been recording this presentation, and that will be available. And I have uh, just two more questions for you, James, and then I think we're, we're really out of time. So let me ask this one first from Monica. She wrote, great presentation. Thank you very much. And this is her question. I prefer to set a management fee to cover more of my labor costs and detail ancillary fees up front with fewer surprise charges. How can I compete with management companies who low bid and get it back in extras? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, I've had some clients that have gone with that all-in management approach, and uh, I'll be really honest with you, it's really hard to make strong margins doing that, uh, but there are some that do it. Uh, one of the best ways to kind of demonstrate uh, where those are is, you know, I would sit with a, a client and say, how much are you spending on your management fee? And they would look to their financials and say, we are spending $18,000 you know, a year. And they would, you know, kind of circle that number and say, that's what we spend. And I would say, well, no, actually you're not. And I would show them where the bodies were buried. And I would say, look, you, you've got this bank charge here. This is coupons. Coupons don't cost that much money. They're marking them up. You know, here's your letters on your late fees. You know, it says in the reimbursable expenses you pay $25 per late charge or per late letter that you send out. So I would show them all the different ways that they pay their manager or their existing, you know, opportunity that they have. Um, a lot of times when you take over a property that has, and again, this is in your game theory, you want to kind of you know, keep these together, but I would take on a property and you go start going through their financials, a lot of times they'll give you contracts that they had with previous management companies, and most management companies don't change their contracts up that much, and so you can show them how to, how to sift through and find out what they would pay and try to get them on the same playing field as yours and show them why that's valuable. And so that's really the best way you can do it. Uh, but uh, that being said, I, I, you know, I, I applaud you for trying to have an all-in uh, fee. I feel like that's uh, definitely in your owner's best interest. But I would say, as a business owner, it's also really hard to make stronger margins uh, when you kind of have that cap. So, great, thank you, James. All right, well, we're about uh, just got under five minutes over, so I think we're we're right on time, right? That, uh, my last name is Drennan, and all my friends call it Drennan time because I'm always a few minutes late to everything. So <laughs> I guess we're on track. Um, so I'm going to close up the webinar for now. Um, I just have one last question I want to pass on to you, and I think it'll be just a short one. Um, somebody wants to know if you do consulting for business development for management companies. I don't know what the definition of consulting is. Um, really, anyone who, who works with us in our bank, uh, you know, they kind of get it as a free deal. It's just kind of part of the package of the value that we add. Uh, if you didn't want to bank with us, and I realize, you know, sometimes folks have, you know, certain relationships, and I, I want to, you know, encourage you to keep those. Um, you know, we can always work something out, and, you know, sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, just do a couple loans with us or throw us some reserve deposits, and, you know, it doesn't even necessarily need to cost money. So. Um, the answer to that can be yes, but it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, um, you know, money exchanging hands and all that. A lot of times it can just be, uh, and, if, you know, I'm, I'm very generous in my time, as I like to think I am, so I'll even help you out if you had a specific project. I mean, so I'll, I'll tell you, no, I'm not afraid to, you know, tell you when you're, you're uh, taking too much. So uh, just have to reach out and, you know, tell me your specifics and take it from there. And you've got all of James's information here on this final slide. James, this was a fantastic webinar. I thank you so much for your time today. And I thank you, everyone, who stayed and uh, hung out for the question and answer period. Uh, we had about 100 people that registered and about 70 who showed up. So a pretty amazing uh, uh, you know, response from the industry. Clearly, this is something that people are interested in, and, and they want to improve their businesses. So once again, these are going to be available online later, and everybody will get an email with that information. And with that, I think uh, we're going to say goodbye today. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks, everybody, for, uh, for staying on. Thanks, Jim.